Welcome to the Unhurried Living Podcast. My name is Alan Fadling, and I invite you to listen to leadership conversations that will help you to develop healthy rhythms of rest and work and to live fuller in friendship with God. I hope this podcast will help you to overcome hurry and make time for what matters most. And now, enjoy today's episode. Hey, friends, welcome to episode 214 of the podcast. My name's Alan, and I'm so glad you've joined me here. I'm hopeful that our time together will help you rediscover an unhurried way of life and leadership. Each week on the podcast, we have leadership conversations to help us lead better in the spirit of Jesus' unhurried way, the way of leadership that flows from a full soul instead of an empty one. Sometimes I'm talking with fellow authors, and sometimes I'm talking with leaders just like you who are learning to live and lead at the fruitful pace of grace and peace. I'm so pleased today to share a recent conversation I had with Kurt Thompson about his latest book, The Soul of Desire. I found so many intersections with what Jim and I have been learning in our journey toward wholeness and vitality in our life in God. Now, in this book, Kurt talks about the place of desire in our lives, how desire can sometimes get hijacked, but how desire can be a holy motive and energy that moves us toward the beautiful life of God he's always intended for us. Kurt Thompson is a board-certified psychiatrist and the founder of Being Known, an organization that develops resources for hope and healing at the intersection of neuroscience and Christian spiritual formation. In addition to The Soul of Desire, he's also the author of The Soul of Shame and Anatomy of the Soul. He's actively engaged in learning and teaching as he supervises clinical employees and facilitates ongoing education groups for patients and colleagues. He also speaks frequently on the topic at workshops, conferences, and retreats. Now, if you're a new listener, welcome to the podcast. If you find these episodes helpful, would you please follow, rate, and review, and be sure to share this podcast with your friends. Now, let's dive into my conversation with Kurt Thompson. On today's Unhurried Living podcast, I'm pleased to have Kurt Thompson, author of The Soul of Desire. Kurt, thanks so much for taking time for this conversation. Alan, thanks so much for having me. It's a joy and a pleasure to be with you. I'm looking forward to it. Well, I always enjoy starting a conversation about a book by asking if you could just tell a little bit of the story of how this particular book came to be. Well, uh, it's uh, a story that um, I uh, that is somewhat different. I, I wrote uh, written two other books prior to this, and yep. both of them had pretty, uh, in, in at least in my mind before they got written, they had pretty clearly uh, defined purposes and form that they had kind of that had emerged. And this one, uh, it, it took a long time in my mind, it, it kind of coming into being. But there, there was a. Uh, I, I had an encounter with the Japanese American artist Mako Fujimura nice. back a number of years ago uh, at his studio when he was working uh, in Pasadena at Fuller Theological mm. Seminary. And uh, over the course of a week that uh, he'd invited myself and a couple of other people to contribute to uh, a project that he was doing there at Fuller, he was uh, doing work on a painting project while we were reflecting and offering thoughts about what was going on from the standpoint of creating beauty and thinking about it in the terms of interpersonal neurobiology and so forth and so on. And out of that uh, week uh, was generated uh, this notion of what is it like for us to begin to, first of all, pay attention to who we are as people of desire, great longing. When people who are coming to my office, people who are making things, people, whatever it is, one of the things that got generated out of this longing for creating an artistic expression is this way in which uh, we want to make things. And that notion of longing not just I long as a newborn longs for the mother's milk or longs to be clothed and warm and secure, but also 
this eventually leads to this uh, desire to make things like this is the other thing that happens in child development. Hmm. So between two and three years of age, they start making stuff and they bring it into your kitchen and they want you to put it up on the refrigerator and charge the neighbor's money to come in and like look at it. <laughs> and you don't have to teach them to do this. They, the kids want it. They, they want to make things. And this really began to strike me, this this notion that so much of our world is uh, uh, lives uh, with a mindset of how it is that I'm going to navigate my day as a series of problems that I have to solve. Oh. Um, even when we think, even, even when we transpose this and we uh, overlay this onto the gospel, uh, for many people, the gospel, the first line out of the gospel is that we are sinners who need to be saved. Now, this is not untrue. That's that's not untrue. But when you read the opening pages of the text of the Bible, that's not the first thing that you read. And even when you read Jesus opening comments in Mark's gospel, when he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he doesn't go out of his way to shame people. He doesn't go out of his way to point out that people are sinners. He's talking. It's an invitation to turn around and look at something that, that, that is beautiful, that is coming, that he's doing. It's about turn around because there is something else that is actually from the beginning. That is what I am ushering into the world, this new beginning, this new heaven and earth, the kingdom of God. As it turns out, we like to say that it's it's best that when we talk about who we are as people, that we begin at the beginning. And that begins in Genesis chapter one, where we see the writers describe for us God as creator. And then he says, we're going to make humankind in our image. And so we are made as makers of beauty in the same way that God is. And so all these notions start to kind of bang around in my head. And I'm thinking, what would happen? What would, what would it be like if we began to, with intention, uh, describe this and talk about this in our practice? What happens when we bring, when people come in for help psychiatrically? And yes, we will, of course, do our typical standard psychiatric evaluations and identify problems and so forth and so forth. But what if quickly in the process, we begin to ask them a different question, mm. which is what is the new artifact of beauty that God is calling you to create mm. in the middle of the life that you have now walked into the office with? And of course, this was starting to catch people off guard because... So much of our life is considered to be a problem that we have to solve, even in churches and church leadership and so forth. We understand our mission often is about we have problems that are coming to our door every day that we have to solve. Yeah. And it's difficult for us to practice imagining that my mission in the world, when I leave my house and walk off my front porch every morning, the question is, what is God preparing for me to make today? What artifact of beauty? And moreover, where and how is that artifact of beauty going to emerge, particularly in those places that I would least expect them to emerge, in the places that are often most traumatic, most painful, most disintegrating? That's a long-winded answer to your question, but I think that mm. what, 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 what the, the book, in some respects, was an even more, what I what for me, was a more uh, was a fuller, more robust response to what I looked at in the soul of shame, this kind of devouring, disintegrating uh, work that evil wants to use shame, you know, to accomplish. Um, and so uh, the other the last thing I'll say is that one of the more striking things for me about this is that when we uh, I primarily uh, engage the world or parts of my world as a problem to solve, I tend to uh, attuned to the world in an analytic, what primarily analytic way that mm. keeps the world at a distance. If I'm going to create in the world, if I'm going to be curious about what is the beautiful thing I'm going to make, it shifts how my brain is actually working. It shifts the way I'm paying attention to the world. Uh, not because I suddenly become, I suddenly think there are no problems. Heavens no. <laughs> but I begin to reimagine problems not ends and in of them in and of themselves, but they are they are things that I'm addressing on the way to creating beauty and goodness in their wake. Yeah. Uh, that's a beautiful way to describe it. And I appreciate sort of your um relating the soul of shame now with this newest book, the mm. the soul of desire, the 
And I, 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 one of the things I hear in what you're saying is, you know, this idea that life is a problem to be solved. It just sounds like survival mode. It, it sounds mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm settling for coping. Like that's all mm -hmm. I need. Mm -hmm. But you're describing a vision of what might a life of thriving mm -hmm. look like. And mm -hmm. so your mm -hmm. statement about what would a beautiful way of working look like and the beautiful mm -hmm. way of being a husband or wife mm -hmm. look like. Can, Mm -hmm. Can you say more about this? Just this idea of what is the purpose of our life? This sort of mm -hmm. thriving life I think you're mm -hmm. describing. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, I think that uh, a, a couple of things, uh, not necessarily in, in or rank order or in order of progression, but uh, everything that we do in the world, in any system, whether it's the church business, education, doesn't matter, is a reflection of what it means for us to be people who are family members. Mm. The human family is the social structure out of which everything else is based. And so when we talk about creating beauty, we look at this notion that this is how children emerge and develop. They, they want to make things, right? So that's one thing to keep in mind. Another thing that's important to keep in mind is that When we pay attention to beauty, per se, uh, I begin not only to notice the beauty that I'm looking at, but I also begin to prime my mind to see beauty where otherwise I would have missed it. Mm. If I were to ask our audience, how many yellow cars have you seen in the last week, unless they actually own a yellow car, most right. people may or may not, they, they wouldn't necessarily be able to say like, well, I've seen three yellow cars, but if I were to give you the assignment, I want you to look for three. I want you to count the number of yellow cars. Not only would you be able to tell me next week, how many you've seen this week, you would continue to count them for probably the next two to three weeks to come. Yeah. Because you're primed with the intention to do this. And this is where we say like, we become what we pay attention to. I become what I pay attention to. And if I am going to live uh, as a reflection of my maker, of my creator in his image, and the first thing that I read about the nature of my creator is that he is a that, he is a creator, he is a maker, and he's not just a maker of average stuff. Right. He's a maker of beauty, right? And, and he looked and saw that it was not good that the Hebrew, that word is interchangeable with the word beauty. Mm. He looked and saw that it was beautiful. And we would say that it wasn't just beautiful object. It was beautiful objectively because he had made it and named it, commissioned it. But there is also a certain sense in which the beauty that he sees emerges as a function of him looking at it. Hmm. And so our children experience and sense their delight in the world, that they, that they are a source of delight as they experience us looking at them, yes. as they experience us enjoying them. And so when we begin the practice, we, we, we give this assignment to patients all the time. We say like, I want you every day to, with intention, put yourself in the path of oncoming beauty in some way, shape or form. I don't care if it's a tree in your neighborhood. I don't care if you go online to look at a painting from a from museum. I don't, if it's a piece of music that you're going to listen to, I want you to, I want you to allow yourself to pay attention to what you are becoming. And in so doing, we literally begin to posture ourselves in the world very, very differently. Mm. If I posture myself in the world such that the world is primarily a problem to solve, one of the things that I do is that I tend to heighten my level of anxiety. I tend to activate and make more likely my fight or flight system primed. Mm. It's very difficult to create things while you're anxious. That's for sure. And so if I'm going to create things, it necessarily helps me calm my brainstem you know, if we were to say, look, I want you to, uh, I want you to spend some time uh, writing the manuscript. Now that might, some of that might be hard work. Some of that might be difficult or, or do the work on the painting or do the work on composing music. It may be hard work. 
practicing the music. It may be hard work, but when I am in that space, I can't both be with this, loving this, and be anxious at the same time. If I'm practicing posturing myself in and toward the world in that way, I'm much more likely to respond to the world like unto that, even when the world shows up trying to provoke me to anxiety and anger and irritability and so forth, because I've had practice attuning to the world in the way that I am. It doesn't make it fail safe. It doesn't mean that like, we'll never be in trouble. We'll never suffer. We'll never like, I mean, you know, look, if, if we'll kill Jesus, we'll kill anybody. And so yeah. it doesn't guarantee absolute safety on the world's terms, but it does mean that in terms of the life that I'm actually living, I can get to the end of the day and say, gosh, I've spent the day creating, which is a very different story that I will have written for that day than I've spent the day being worried and anxious about the problems I can't solve. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, I One of the things I noticed that you draw on sort of the classic transcendentals, right? Goodness, mm-hmm. beauty, truth. And you point out that kind of in our Western experience of those, we tend to rivet ourselves on whatever we think truth means. Mm-hmm. And then goodness sort of flows from that. And maybe, maybe we'll give a little bit of attention to beauty. But you're really mm-hmm. inviting us in terms of the practicality of our experience, that that's not really the sequence of how it tends to work best anyway. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is where the work of von Balthasar from a theological standpoint has been yeah. so, I mean, like, wow. I mean, I don't know where this guy's been all my life, but, uh, he, he's not nearly been, I'm not, I'm not spending enough time. And, um, mm. uh, but I, I think it was, uh, it was striking to me to, um, uh, you know, r- you know, actually not reading von Balthasar directly because like, I can't read German and I, uh, and, and it would be uh, like, even if I, it was, even if it was the English, it was just a lot. So reading yeah. his interpreter, Aidan Nichols, yeah. who highlighted that von Balthasar was the one who was describing the, uh, uh, this sense that we first sense things that beauty is our sense of goodness. Mm. Goodness has a particular aesthetic attraction to us. I don't just see something as good because somehow I abstractly, I just kind of like know that it's good. Like I have some felt sensation of the thing that is good. Mm, that is a good meal. Mm. Well, how do I know that? Well, because it's, it's, it's what I sense. It's what I taste. And von Balthazar was saying like, this is where our experience as human beings begins. Mm. beauty becomes what goodness is clothed in that draws us to it, which then demonstrates what is true. Mm. And what was so striking to me about this theological description and and philosophical description of the way the world is, uh, is so consonant with and in lockstep with this notion of how we you know, uh, in shorthand, like to talk about how the mind tends to operate bottom to top and right to left. First, we sense, mm. and then we make sense of what we sense. We are perceiving things that we are sensing in a whole conglomerate set of ways. And at some point, we begin to literally, linguistically make sense of this thing that I'm sensing for good or for ill, whether it's the beauty of the sunset or the joy of the embrace of my friend, or if it's the abuse that I've undertaken that I've, that I've experienced, whatever this is, I'm going to have to make sense of it because if I don't make sense of it, I'll lose my mind. Hmm. And the thing is, is that I oftentimes make sense of it. And especially trauma, I make sense of it in a way that enables me to survive it. But this is where we get this awareness that, Trauma not only shatters my sense of self, but it also interferes with a proper way for me to perceive what has actually happened to me. Mm. Yeah. And so the very mechanics that I want to employ to help me make sense of what has happened to me themselves, that, that, that those mechanics themselves are disrupted. And so consequently, I end up telling a story, not just about what has happened to me, but 
what my role was in it and why it is that like, yeah, how, and which is how it is that people often find themselves blaming themselves for things that have happened to them when in fact, they had very little to do with whatever it is that, that, that has happened to them. And this is what evil wants to do. It wants to use these experiences to disintegrate us, to devour us. And what we are suggesting is that when, you know, if, 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 you know, if I were to, if I were to do something for which I felt ashamed, perhaps even if I wasn't primarily responsible and you, Alan, were to come along and say, well, Kurt, you don't need to be ashamed of that. I might think you're a lovely guy and I might believe that, you know, it's really sweet that you believe that. Yeah. But those words in of themselves make it, it's very difficult for me to appropriate that. It's very difficult for me to like, but if you were to sit with me, if I were to sit with you and three or four other people for an extended period of time in which I didn't just take in your words, but I took in your sight line. I took in your eye, your gaze. I took in the tone of voice. I took in your tears. I took in these kinds of things. Those things start to speak to what I sense. Mm -hmm. And I now continue to tell you my story over and over. And instead of shame being the response that I get from you, I get a completely different response. It literally gives my right hemisphere in my brain. It literally gives the part of my mind that senses things a literally a different thing that it is sensing hmm. in the face of my remembering the traumatic event, which means that traumatic event can now be linked to a different outcome, not because somehow magically I'm rewriting the facts of what happened 10 years ago, but because I'm literally retelling the story of what I'm doing to make sense of what happened 10 years ago right now in the room. Mm. And we would say that that act of me sitting with four or five others who are loving me into the kingdom, a way for me to do a way that we could talk about this, that is an act of creation. Mm. That is an act of new creation, and it is creating something new in the face of something that is terribly traumatic. And we would say, this is what God is doing on Good Friday. He is the one and the only one who can see that what's happening in that space is the end of death and the beginning of new creation. Mm. And of course, we can't see it. The disciples couldn't see it. And the reality is there are plenty of parts of my own story and my own life where I still think that. Like, I, I can't see the new creation coming. But this is where I actually need the body of Jesus. I need somebody else's eyes on my story in order for them to imagine what is happening and give my imagination time to catch up. Mm. God saw Easter coming, something that evil didn't see coming, and God could imagine this. Jesus, like this whole notion, where how many times in the Gospels where and Jesus foretold that he would be crucified, but and he and on the third day he would be raised. And like you read those texts in Matthew's and Luke's gospel, and it's like they just keep going. It's just like, yeah, could you pass the peas, please? Yeah. Uh, and like, no, can't even imagine it. It like, seems, excuse me. Did you hear what he said? Like, what's like, like there doesn't, it's, 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 it's that lost on them. And I'm no different. Yeah. And this is why community that we also talk about in the book, why community can be such a powerful advocate for our hearts because the community is doing the work of imagination patiently waiting for my imagination to catch up. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, you know, so the the book's title is, you know, The Soul of Desire. And I, I think of desire in my own experience. Uh, in my early experience as a relatively conservative Christian, desire was sort of a thing to be distrusted, uh, yeah. denied perhaps, pretended mm -hmm. it wasn't there. In maybe more contemporary settings, it sometimes feels as though desire is the end all and be all. If I feel like it, if I even have the slightest impulse toward it, it must be pursued. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you mm -hmm. could just talk about sort of maybe the holy place 
mm-hmm. of desire at the center of who, mm-hmm. who God has made mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. You know, at one space in the uh, one place in the book, I write about how, you know, look, if my uh, if, if it is true, as Augustine wrote. That uh, my desire is for God, then what I want to say to God is like, why the heck can't you just show up and compete? <laughs> like. I can so much more easily identify other stuff that I far more quickly, easily, tangibly desire yeah. than you. Like, what the heck? Yeah. And I think that th- this, would, this, is, this is exemplary of what it means for us to be, you know, the heirs of thousands of years of human brokenness such that uh, desire for God in the way that the writer of the Ecclesiastes puts it, when God has put eternity in our hearts, it's not just a function of time. It's a function of depth. Yeah. There is this longing that I have. And we, we like to talk about this notion of what it means to develop secure attachment. And there are these four words, all each of which begins with S to be seen, soothe, safe, secure mm. that in some way, shape or form are, are ways of getting at this question of desire that for me to be seen as a newborn, as an infant, then is for me to be soothed. Then is for me to have put before me as an environment that is safe. I, 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 I become comfortable and confident in the system in which I occupy in order for me then to securely venture out and take risks that are good for me to take and even make mistakes perhaps and come back to this space where I can be seen, soothed and safe once again. But that isn't just a project for the first 18 months of life. Like that's a project for the rest of our lives until we're dead And that longing, we say that whenever we're doing things that we long for, like in some way, shape or form, that longing is going to show up in some version of one or more of those four words. Mm. And to the degree that I have longed for things that, that I long for things like I am reflecting that I've been made in God's image. Like we are a longing, wanting, desiring people, everything from physical appetites, then to be known, then to go on and to make things. And we are also aware that uh, in, in, in the Christian anthropology of the world, we believe that we don't live in a neutral universe, mm. that we live in a universe in which evil is actively intending to devour us. And as such, we are uh, it, it and, you know, it's 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 parasitic. It latches on to those things that are beautiful and good and true, like desire and turns it in a direction where in which my desire is transformed into devouring. Yeah. And so it makes sense that I have to be aware of how my desire is both beautiful and can easily be hijacked. We uh, love, you know, we, we, we humans love to be able to know exactly what the rules are. Where are the boxes that I can keep things neat and tidy? Where does, where is my, where am I allowed to be desiring of things? Like this is like, you know, so, you know, when in uh, Luke 19, where the, you know, the Sadducees come to Jesus and say, well, whose, whose wife will it be when after like, they want all these rules or like, Hey, Moses gave us this, you know, decree that we could divorce our wife. Like what, what, what else can we do? Like, what's going to be on the test? What am I allowed to do that I'm not going to get into trouble for? Yeah. And you get this sense that Jesus is saying, like, I want real, professional, mature human beings. I want people who can discern things. Who are I'm, I'm not just going to treat you like children where you just need to, like, know exactly where to put your shoes when you come home. Like, you should be able to know how to do this on your own. And so... This sense of being able to have longing that I can identify and practice being curious about and appropriating where in my life am I longing to be seen, soothed, safe, secure, even as an adult, and where is that not happening? And how 
am I sometimes perhaps because of my traumas or, and, th and that trauma can be things that have happened to me that shouldn't have happened. It can be things that didn't happen for me that should have happened. Yeah. How is that shaping a misdirection of those desires? And how can my being in community help me to uh, navigate the borderland areas where in which uh, it's not always easy for me to discern how close am I to that space where my desire is going to be turned into devouring? Yeah. The, the, you know, I, um, I really appreciate that. And, and you've begun to talk a bit about an idea you describe really in the second half of the book, which is to say these, this way in which a confessional community can be an important place for those who are a part of them to mm. experience, you know, healing or, or integration or a deeper, mm -hmm. richer life. Can you talk uh, maybe not only just about the specifics of a confessional community, but maybe just more generally how relationship is so much a part of our becoming who God's intended us to mm -hmm. be? Mm -hmm. Indeed, I think uh, when we read the second chapter of Genesis and we hear God talking about it's not good for the man to be alone, uh, I think that that statement has lots of anthropological implications. There's so many different ways in which we often fail to recognize that my distress and my anxiety and my all the things that I worry about is functionally directly uh, related to my sense of being alone with whatever it is that I'm perceiving. Hmm. When Jesus uh, in Luke 10 or 11, whatever, I think, I forget what it is, where, where he, maybe it's 12, where, where he, he's saying like, look, don't be anxious for anything. Like, look at, look at the ravens, look at the lilies. And I'm like, yeah, look at the ravens. Like it's a bird brain. Like he doesn't have to pay bills. It doesn't have to pay taxes. Right? It doesn't like But he he doesn't just say, he doesn't just say don't worry. That's right. He says your father in heaven. Your father in heaven. You're so much more valuable than a raven. Your father in heaven. And part of the challenge is that we, we begin with this notion that like, I, I walk around on the earth perceiving and believing that I am alone. I don't perceive my father in heaven. I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of him paying attention to me. And so we do a lot of work grounding people in this reality. This is, this is relational gravity. This is, it's that kind of law. Like you can't go anywhere without gravity being in play. We can't do anything without the relational laws of the need for connection being in play. And so confessional communities create the space in which, especially as we, uh, you know, look at our trauma and our shame, we like to say that, that you know, the, our shame gets appropriated kind of like a locomotive. I mean, if you were a, a locomotive moving at three miles an hour, like you couldn't stop it. You could stop a red wagon if it were moving at three miles an hour, but not a locomotive. And mm. that's what shame is like for us, the payload of it is that dense what we need is a bigger train mm. i need a bigger train that can stop that and that bigger train is community i need other people's minds in the room that i can borrow from i need other mass literally mass effect that i can pay attention to that doesn't just give me more information doesn't make me smarter it makes me more connected mm literally more deeply connected in my mind to more people who are able to create ballast for me in embodied ways. And so when we look at these, you know, confessional communities, we, we, we talk about, you know, their, their, their makeup. We want people who are, you know, to be in them. Uh, you, you wonder like, well, how do you, how do you do this? How do you create these? One thing is that there, there are some, like some minimum requirements. We want people to be able to regulate themselves emotionally. I, it's hard to be in a confessional community if one day you're there and the next day that you're not, or one day you're there or the next day you're saying, I think I'm going to kill myself. I guess, mm -hmm. Like a community doesn't survive that very well. Right. We also need to know that people can keep confidences in these confessional communities. 
you know, in the ones that we run at, at in one of our forms that we run at the practice, both men and women are part of it. And of course, this this can create questions and distress for some people because they worry about like, well, what are the things you're going to, like, well, you know, like, cause there is this thing called sex. So I'm like, yeah, but this thing called sex is like everywhere in the world. Like, I don't know if you know that or not. Right. But if like, if you don't address this someplace, you're going to like, it's going to, it like, it happens in church pews. Yes. People are having sex in church all the time. And we're not, we, we don't like, we're not gonna, that's like touching the third rail. And so we're really trying to just be honest about the fact that whenever men and women are in the room, things like arousal and things like longing as expressed sexually is going to be in the room. The question is, what do we do Mm. in response to it? What happens when we begin to name, oh, that I'm having this felt sense of like being attracted to this person who's not my wife. At which point we often ask the question, well, what what does that mean? Right? Because he said, well, I'm attracted to this person. I don't want to do that. So I'm just, I'm, but what I'm really often saying when I say that I'm attracted to a person, I'm saying like I perceive my longing to be seen, soothed, safe, made secure mm-hmm. by this person. Which, of course, if I'm having that kind of a longing in that space, it creates the next question, which is, gosh, what is it about my story that is true such that I don't have that already? Yeah. Where is that need for being any of those four words? Where has that been missing? Where have my traumas, where have my unfinished, where's my unfinished business, my wounds bringing that lack of those things into the space? Mm. Being in a space like that with others evokes my awareness of this where heretofore I often just find all kinds of coping strategies that just make sure I just never have to look at it. But instead, these communities create space where parts of me that I would much rather you not know are revealed. Mm. And as they are revealed, the shame that accompanies them is also brought into the light in order to be healed and recommissioned. Mm. And in the book, we talk about questions that we ask about this and, and how priming ourselves in these communities, recognizing that what we are trying to do in these communities, that we're not coming just to solve problems. I'm not coming here just to learn more. I'm not coming here just to beef up my, you know, understanding of the book of James. I'm coming here on a mission to create beauty and goodness in the world, not least of which being in this very community in order for that then to extend into the rest of the world in which I live. I love, uh, I love that image. And as you move through the the latter part of the book, one of the things you do is I think there are four chapters that unpack phrases from a verse that's been really foundational for me uh, for a long time. It's mm-hmm. a line in Psalm 27. I'd love, I'd love to just read it. And I'd love for you to just comment, um, because I I love these lines. He says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Mm. It's such, (laughs) Mm. I've loved it for so long because of Mm. how rich it is, but I'd love to Mm. hear how Mm. Those lines have a way of describing mm. maybe some of the focus of these confessional mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. communities. Well, you know, Alan, you know, one of the things that's so uh, interesting about this verse is that the the psalm in which the verse is embedded is a psalm of longing itself. It's asking God for things. Yeah. And scholars have uh, rightly pointed out that the fourth verse seems really out of place. You've got this psalm that has this continual asking of God for things and so forth and all the, all the need. And then plop in the middle of this, there is this here. I'm, I want to dwell and gaze and inquire. And I was on a call last, just last night uh, with a group of uh, folks, uh, one of whom pointed out this, this person is uh, from a Jewish tradition. And this person pointed out like, the very thing that the psalmist is asking for is desire. One thing I've asked for. It's one thing. In fact, would be considered by Hebrews at the time to be forbidden. 
right? You don't like you don't get to dwell in the temple. You know, that's not that's that's only for priests and only in certain times, right? There's a certain and yet yeah. David is, I mean, this is a cat who has no guile and he has he has no hesitation in telling God what he wants, which I think this verse. You know, as we were saying earlier, there are all, all kinds of the, the, our desires make us nervous, make us anxious. Yeah, there's a certain forbidden nature to this, right? That's embedded in who we are, and David is putting it right out on the table. Hmm. And over the course of this verse, we hear first of all that there's just one thing he's going to persevere. He's serious about this one thing that I may dwell. This notion that I'm going to remain. I'm going to be in a place. I'm not just going to be part time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to be temporary. Uh, this is not going to be. Uh, it's not going to be cell phone coverage. Right? This is not about just. This is not on the internet. I'm going to dwell. I'm going to remain in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. In the house of the Lord, this sense that what began as a tabernacle mm -hmm. and emerged into the temple that in John two Jesus further transforms and says, "No, this is actually me." And at Pentecost is then distributed through the Holy Spirit into the entire body of believers that Paul then writes about in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, this notion that like we are the house of the Lord, yeah. but not just I, but like you and I collectively together are. So for me to dwell all the days of my life in the house of the Lord means in many respects, eventually for me to be deeply connected in community. In the body of Jesus. So I'm going to be planted in that space, but that takes perseverance, that takes practice, that takes great intentionality, practicing over and over and over again, yeah. which is hard to do. But I don't just dwell for the sake of like just living someplace. I'm dwelling in order to gaze. And this is the other thing that would be, of course, been forbidden. Like, how does one see the face of God and live? Right. But this is what he's saying. Like, this is what I want. I'm going to gaze upon your beauty. I'm not just glancing. I'm putting on my sunglasses, my Ray-Bans, and just, I, no, I'm going to gaze. But when we see this notion of gazing in light of the Gospels, when we imagine the early church and its memory of gazing upon Jesus, that the glory of the Lord, when Jesus says to God in John's Gospel, glorify your son as I have glorified you, this you know, to glorify him was to be captured on Good Friday. Like, like that doesn't make any sense to us. That's it. Yes, of course, I can look upon a beautiful sunset. I can look upon a Van Gogh. I can listen to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Like, I can gaze and be immersed and dwell in things that are easily and obviously beautiful. Mm -hmm. But the Christian story is one in which God is even transforming what we imagine beauty to be and out of where it can come. Yeah. And so to gaze upon the part of me that I like might not be that difficult, but for me to reveal the part of me that I hate the most and to allow you to gaze upon that, that's a horse of a completely different color. Oh yeah. And I'm inviting the reader to consider that that kind of that, that that gazing is there is a beauty in allowing myself to be seen in that way because of what is coming behind it. That when Jesus is gazed upon by the father at his crucifixion, God is already looking two days hence mm. and seeing Easter coming, something that evil doesn't see coming. And as long as we are able to gaze and be gazed upon, it creates the space in which I can now allow myself to inquire of the Lord. I can ask him for things. I can ask him about things. When Jesus says repeatedly in the Gospels, unless you change and become like little children, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. He's not just saying, unless you become like this, I won't let you in. He's saying like, no, like it's just not going to work for you. Right. And what did children do? They have no hesitation in asking any and every question that come into their mind. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is saying, this is what it is like to be in the kingdom. And then we, you know, we explore these four questions of where are you from Genesis three? 
Mm. These are the questions that we repeatedly return to in this confessional community. Where are you? The second question being from John 1, 38, the first words of Jesus recorded in John's gospel. What do you want? Mm -hmm. That's a question that we could spend a lot of time talking about. What do you want? Makes me nervous too, because like, I want to know what the right answer is. Or maybe I don't even know because... I've been burying my desire for such a long time. What do you want? Can you drink the cup? This is Matthew 20, where he speaks to John and James, who said that we'd like to be on your right and your left when you come into your kingdom. And he says, you don't really even know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup? Acknowledging that if we're going to live into this life of dwelling and gazing and inquiring, that we are going to have to encounter and address our suffering. That suffering is part of the deal. And in fact, when Jesus says in Matthew 19, suffer the children to come unto me. Mm. This notion that like the disciples didn't really want those parts of their, like they had work to do. They wanted to get on with it. Like people bringing their kids like this is like, this is, this is not necessary. Right. And in the same way, we each have parts of our own developmental stories where our wounds have taken place, where we have gotten stuck developmentally. And I don't want them coming into the room either. Yeah. And so when Jesus says, no, suffer them to come, there is a certain acknowledgement that to do this, to do the work of regeneration, to do the work of new creation, like, crucifixion is the way we go. Like it's not pick up your Tesla and follow me. It's pick up your cross. Yeah. And I don't really like that language. I don't like it. And I uh, would much rather it be very different, but it's a question that he asks, can you drink the cup? And am I then able to enter into that? And then asking the question, do you love me? When he asked Peter in John 21, Jesus doesn't ever stop turning stones over coming for Peter in his residual shame for what had happened six weeks earlier or however long it had been. Mm. And now we become also agents of turning shame's stones over where our shame is hidden in order for us to be recommissioned for the work of beauty and goodness that had been prepared for us before the foundation of the world. Jesus doesn't just ask Peter this question. He then commissions him and says, like, I want you to feed my sheep. I have work for you to do. And I'm asking you, we're pursuing, like we're looking for where shame is hiding out, not to shame you, but to heal it in order for you to no longer have to be burning energy containing that so that that energy can now be directed to me, pay attention to me and the work that I have for you to do the beauty and goodness that I have for you with me and with others to create in the world. Now that's uh, sounds so inviting. And I appreciate how you put that into words for us. Uh, I wonder as we close our conversation, if you would be willing just to maybe share a word of invitation or encouragement to the listener who's hearing what you're sharing and saying, there's something in this for me. There's something I'm recognizing my own need for, but maybe I'm afraid. Maybe I'm reluctant. Maybe I feel it's, maybe that's for everybody else. I'm not sure that's for me. Hmm. Can you just share a word or two as we close? Yeah. I, you know, Alan, I would say, first of all, uh, life is hard. And we, 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 for our listeners who are hearing this and who are, uh, uh, who have the faint sense of hope, but who also worry, but who also are tempted to not believe this because it's too risky. It's too hard. It's too confusing. It's too vulnerable. I want to say, uh, I would say to you, like, I get it. Yeah. I would say all those things that you sense and worry about and feel like I, I would say like, you're feeling them not because you're stupid or because you're weak or because you're a coward. Uh, I would say that you're feeling them because uh, evil's intention is to traumatize and devour you. And it doesn't want you knowing this, it do- let alone acting upon it. And so I would say it's really hard. It's hard to do. Yeah. 
uh, it wasn't me who said narrow is the gate and few there are that pass therein. Like it's, it's not narrow because God makes it narrow. It's narrow because to create beauty, to become beauty and goodness in the world is really, really hard to do. We would say that the, those things that are most durable and most beautiful in the world take a long time and a lot of effort to create. And so I, I have great empathy for those who find it to be difficult to take the risk of entering into this kind of a life. And at the same time, I would uh, say uh, in my own life and in the life of my friends and the life of the people that I've seen that are doing this work in our, in our practice, in our confessional communities, uh, there's nothing more glorious that you'll ever do in your, in your life. Um, it's better than sex <laughs> because with sex, we're just pretty much looking for orgasm. And with orgasm, when it's over, it's over. And joy that we discover in dwelling and gazing and inquiring only ever expands. It doesn't ever end. And in this way, uh, taking the risk of telling your story to one person, just trying with one person mm. is the beginning of a journey that we like to talk about as being, we're, we're practicing for heaven. We're getting ready for the world that's coming. Yeah. Whether it comes tomorrow or it comes a hundred thousand years from now, uh, we want to be the kind of solid people that will be able to live in that world of beauty and goodness when it arrives. That's such a good invitation. It makes me think of the line, you know, uh, John in his first epistle. He says, "You know, walk in the light as God's in the yeah. light." We maybe imagine light is shaming and exposing. But the light of God, uh, it's a light of mercy, uh, yeah. grace, a kind and good and gracious yeah. and gentle light. And, and uh, that is indeed uh, inviting. Mm. Mm. Well, again, today our guest has been Kurt Thompson, mm. and we've been talking about his book, The Soul of Desire. Kurt, thanks so much. It's been really a pleasure to talk today. Alan, thanks so much for the invitation. It's been a real joy to be with you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. I loved especially Kurt's unpacking of one of my very favorite verses, Psalm 27, verse 4. The first two words of that text are simply one thing. It speaks of simplicity. It implies a kind of unity or integration at the center of who God has made and is making me. It's a word of priority and of highest value. One thing, what has God made us for? What is God remaking us for? Again, it's that we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Doesn't that sound inviting? Doesn't that seem compelling? Doesn't it look beautiful? Now, in the next few episodes before our May and early June break, we'll be talking with author Ed Corey about his book, Becoming a Face of Grace, and I'll share leadership conversations about a couple more chapters of the book I've written with my wife, Jim. And that book is What Does Your Soul Love? I can't wait to share those with you. Now, if you'd like to receive more help from Unhurried Living, I invite you to join our Unhurried Daily email list. For 40 days, we'll send you a brief daily email that offers personal reflections from life and scripture to help you take the next step in following Jesus' unhurried way. You can sign up on our website at unhurriedliving.com. We're honored to encourage thousands of leaders just like you. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to the Unhurried Living Podcast. Join me next time to learn more about following the genius of Jesus' unhurried way of life and leadership.